Um, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers today uh, with Dr. Nikos Lavranos, Secretary General of the European Federation of Investment Law and Arbitration, and owner of NL Investment uh, Consulting as a moderator. Alongside him, he'll be joined by Tafadswa Pasinodoya um, from Folly Hoag uh, in DC, uh, Dr. Oseas uh, Reposis from uh, Queen Emmanuel's London office, and Jeff Clazen from Cobra and Kim in New York. Before I pass over to Nikos, I would certainly encourage you to ask questions throughout and interact with the audience and panelists using the stage chat function on the right hand side of the screen. Um, after the webinar and presentations, we will open up our speed networking platform for one on one conversations with panelists and delegates to, to continue the discussions. Nikos, I will leave it in your very capable hands to, to guide the discussions. Uh, thank you all. I look forward to hearing from you now. Thank you so much, John, and uh, thank you uh, to all of you for attending, uh, which I hope is going to be a really interesting uh, uh, webinar. Um, before we go to the uh, discussion, and we have uh, chopped the discussion up in a couple of pieces, uh, I would like just to give a quick uh, rundown to where the ONCI trial working group three on ISDS reforms negotiations are. Uh, because that is actually um, the basic uh, or the basis for this uh, webinar. So uh, about three years ago, um, the uh, UNCITRAL created this special working group three on ISDS reforms uh, in order to examine and identify perceived or real issues of ISDS um, and ways to reform the ISDS system, ISDS meaning, of course, investor to state dispute settlement uh, proceedings, which are contained in essentially all bilateral investment treaties and uh, the investment chapters of free trade agreements. Um, this actually uh, has been driven uh, to a large extent uh, by the EU and its member states, uh, Canada, Mauritius, and a couple of other states um, mainly because especially in the EU there has been a backlash against ISDS um, generally um, there's been pressure by the NGOs there's been pressure by uh, parliaments European parliament uh, domestic parliaments in many member states and uh, that is also the reason why at a certain point um, we talk about like 2013 2014 um, the EU um, started to think about reforming the ISDS system. And they came up with uh, the what we call the Investment Court System, ICS, apologies for all these acronyms, um, which was included actually in CETA, which is the EU-Canada uh, uh, Free Trade Agreement. Um, and it was also included in the EU-Singapore um, free Trade Agreement and EU-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement. Um, so the EU set a stage um, uh, with regards to the um, new way uh, how it sees investor-to-state disputes. Um, at the same time, we've seen now more recently with the ACMEA judgment of the European Court of Justice uh, that um, ISDS within the EU has been essentially banned. This has been uh, recently extended um, with the Comstroy judgment also for the Energy Charter uh, Treaty disputes intra EU. Um, so there has been a, quite a backlash um, in some parts of the world, not everywhere, I should say. For instance, Japan, uh, I'll come to that in a minute, has been resisting um, this uh, new uh, system in its, in its free trade event with the EU, for instance. Um, but nonetheless, at uh, the UNCITRAL Working Group, you can see um, what they describe now. There is a broad support for uh, a number of changes at uh, different levels. Um, we have, for instance, a um, draft code of conduct um, that has been essentially agreed upon and I think will be adopted very soon. There has been discussion about uh, third party funding and further disclosure of third party funding. Um, and there is also discussion about creating a advisory center for uh, investment disputes that would uh, essentially help uh, developing and least developing countries um, in their defense, 
of cases, um, but also in terms of training and outreach and things like that. But, and this is the core of our discussion today, the main issue is the idea of creating a permanent multilateral investment court, the MIC. Um, and in its uh, most extensive form, it would be actually a two-tiered system with a first instance court and a, an appeal body, an appeal court, um, very similar to the one that we know from the unfortunately now rather dysfunct appellate body at the WTO, at the World Trade Organization. Um, and uh, the idea essentially is to move from arbitration into a court system, meaning that um, at least the investors would not be able to um, select um, any of the judges or arbitrators, whatever you call them, um, but that it would be a, a, a fixed um, body of fixed pre-selected members selected by the contracting parties, by the states who are also potentially at the same time also uh, respondents to such disputes. And this raises um, a host of questions um, that we're going to address in a minute. Um, and of course, the question uh, when we look at the bigger picture is, um, does it address the various concerns that are raised effectively, efficiently, or is this something um, that is essentially a window dressing? Um, are there actually uh, other elephants in the room that should be addressed and have not been addressed for various policy reasons or political reasons? Um, and what does it mean for the fact that for some time, so whatever direction it will take, we will have um, two systems running in parallel, the old system of the 3000 bits um, and whatever form the new system will have. So this is uh, essentially the backdrop um, of uh, these negotiations. And I should add, uh, this uh, webinar is extremely timely because in uh, about three, four weeks, we will have uh, the next uh, in-person, actually, negotiation round in Vienna of the Uncitral Working Group. And then the next one, actually, already in um, February, if I'm not mistaken, next year in New York. So. Um, there is um, increasing uh, speed and pressure in the negotiation room uh, to come to some concrete results. So uh, also from that perspective, it is highly um, relevant uh, that we have this uh, conversation today. And uh, we have really a stellar panel with uh, various backgrounds and various expertise. Um, and uh, the first question, I will go to ladies first, and that is Tafi. Um, and that is one of the core issues um, that has been also uh, driving the discussion um, at the negotiations is, how can we be sure that the right people are selected? How can we be sure that it's not going to be a pro-state biased court? Um, how can we ensure that uh, actually it will be inclusive, taking into account non-white male uh, persons uh, or, or, or excluding them? Because so far uh, uh, the majority is uh, white and, and male in terms of arbitrators. So what, what would be your first thoughts about that? Thank you very much, Nikos, and thank you to the Global Legal Group for, for inviting me to this discussion. And as Nikos says, it's so it's so timely. Um, and the selection and nomination of investment court judges or arbitrators is really critical to the success of the court. The way in which the judges are selected has the potential to address some of the most fundamental concerns that critics have expressed with the system. Um, you mentioned the diversity of arbitrators. It's a small pool of arbitrators it's been famously referred to as male, pale and stale. Um, and as, as Secretary General Anna Juban Brett mentioned in a talk she gave last week, three quarters of the ISDS disputes concern um, 
states that are neither American or or Western European, and yet um, non-Western arbitrators make up a less of a quarter of the arbitrators. So the that that is a key criticism. An even larger one probably is the perception that arbitrators lack independence and impartiality because they're picked by the arbitrators themselves, uh, sorry, by the parties themselves, or the decisions of the arbitrators are driven by the wish to be reappointed or tainted by the fact that the arbitrators uh, serve as arbitrators and counsel, double hatting, hatting as it's called. So these key criticisms have affected the legitimacy of ISDS. They've affected the way in which states are are um, complying with the awards and enforcing them. And the hope really is that the court's system of nominating the judges and arbitrators addresses these concerns. And it was quite exciting to see the note by the secretariat that was issued um, two or three weeks ago, because it's just starting to begin to shed light on the current thinking of the selection of, of arbitrators. And these will be debated um, in November, as Nico says, but we can already have a sense of where the secretariat is going with this. Um, in terms of the selection of qualified people, there's always been a concern that once you once you have an investment court that's permanent, it, the decision on arbitrators becomes politicized. So the secretariat has tried to address some of the concerns with politicization by suggesting that there be a panel, a selection panel that looks um, at, at, at candidates and has an open and rigorous process of accepting candidates, open to everybody um, who's qualified, and then reviewing them and vetting them to ensure that they, they meet the, the qualifications, which will be, um, there'll be a focus on public international law and investment law experience, as well as integrity um, and um, of the arbitrators. So you'll have this, this apolitical body vetting the, vetting the, the potential candidates and then make recommendations to the state so that the states are only um, picking from a pool that is qualified. And, and the concern you mentioned, Nikos, of, of making sure that the courts are not biased, uh, the, the, the court is not biased towards states is, is one that you often hear uh, expressed by, by, by companies. Um, and and it's, it's good to remind people that you have courts that are exist now um, um, that are that are addressing concerns, human rights concerns by individuals, and you don't have the concern that the state's appointed judges are somehow biased towards the state. And you can have the same with an investment court. Um, the secretariat's note gives a few ways in which to address concerns um, about bias, and one of those is having a long term a long a long term with no renewal for the in, for the arbitrators so um the idea is that the for example a, an arbitrator would be selected for nine years with no renewal so that he can or she can make their decisions without any political pressure um and without an eye towards re-election and there's also the suggestion that they be full-time um arbitrators or judges so that they don't have uh, to have concerns about financial security. And these are these are ways in which the they are trying to ensure that the courts are not biased. And in terms of having the investors have a voice also in 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 selecting um, the the arbitrators, um, I understand that the goal will be to have a, an open system of nominating um, potential arbitrators and and have it be broad based so so companies can nominate people civil society can nominate people they would still be vetted by the selection panel before mm -hmm. it goes forward to to the states um if i if i could just also very quickly note that it, to address the concerns of diversity the the secretariat's note suggests that um, the panel, the, the panel of arbitrators in within the court, be repre representatives of states that are parts of the treaty, but not ev not having full representation. So mm -hmm. it won't be the case that every state will have uh, will be able to to pick an arbitrator. But you would have um, the way many courts function currently, many international courts, you would have. Um, each group, each regional group, select uh, a couple of arbitrators, 
and the and then you would have selective representation rather than full representation and there would also be quotas and targets potentially um, concerning diversity which which I understand will be not only gender diversity, geographical diversity, religious diversity as well will be included. So there, there's a lot of thinking that went into to this, um, this, this note by the Secretariat and it'll be really interesting to see how the debate goes in November. Absolutely, yeah, thank you so much. So, so when I can summarize it, what I heard from you is that you are pretty happy with the note and the the proposals because there are several options mm -hmm. per article that they um, propose. So it's still, at least on paper, it's still an open debate. We have not made any choices yet in the negotiations, right? But generally okay. you're happy with it, right? At least I think it, it tries to address many of the concerns and, and it'll be interesting to hear from the negotiating states how far and how comfortable they are with the extent to which which these concerns have been addressed and and it's very difficult with for example even the the terms um the idea it would be good to have full-time um arbitrators who then don't have to worry about having other jobs or or employment that will affect potentially their decisions but then you narrow down on diversity if you have to select you have fewer fewer judges and arbitrators and narrow potentially the diversity of the arbitrators if they have to be full-time um, as opposed to part-time. So so there still really are a lot of questions, but it's it's good to have some, some proposals um, that could address the concerns for now. Absolutely. No, I, I think there's just one point that we have to move to the next point, but one point, of course, that has been raised by some, um, for instance, also Japan and other states is that um, also, that um, selection panel, or to put it more um, um, open, the question is, who is going to select the selection panel members? Uh, that will states again. So are the states not already kind of like uh, um, making uh, strategic choices who they want in the selection panel, which then also translates in their vetting process? Um, in terms of potentially being biased, uh, pro-state biased. But that's something that has been raised, we don't know. Um, uh, but I think, realistically speaking, of course, we um, probably are all human beings and we cannot avoid uh, to be biased in one way or another. So I think we have to accept some kind of uh, bias in one way or another. The, the question is the balance, of course. Um, at the same time, I say there were other states who were saying, well, states are not stupid and they will also select um, arbitrators that also have uh, maybe more eye for the investors. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of a, an offensive interest, right? Um, so that could balance out um, if you make that uh, uh, choice, uh, actually. But yeah, Nicholas, I just, just to jump in on that, I think it's an important consideration that states are not always defendants. States are the ones that would right. like to have investments. They would like to build this green economy that everyone's talking about post-COVID recovery. They would like to attract investment and, and they will be looking at, at this um, system as one that will help them promote or facilitate investment as well as ensuring that they're not um, facing claims that they don't think are warranted or there's a fair way to, way to make decisions once, once they have been sued. Right. Thank you so much. Um, let's move to the next uh, level, um, and that is uh, something, let's uh, call it uh, the, the, the jurisdictional aspects. Um, and I move to Odysseus. So, you know, as I said before, um, uh, the question is essentially we have the old system still running, uh, and in addition, we might very soon have uh, this new system on top of it or next to it. So how would you see it? How can we avoid this fragmentation? How would you see, how can we ensure that uh, everybody knows to which court to go or to which tribunal? Well, that's why you need competent counsel, arbitration, <laughs> to advise you on those matters, right? <laughs> Hi, everyone. And thanks again to the Global Legal Group for extending uh, this invitation. Um, and it is, as Taffy said, a topical discussion on important subjects. So. Um, taking your point, 
Uh, I mean, obviously, we can only speculate at this point in time because it's just a draft paper that we have from from Yunshintron and Secretariat. But uh, you know, um, even if we 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 look at what they put in that draft, it seems uh, to me that it's really open ended. Um, you know, at this particular juncture, so um, I think it's, it's draft provision to or close to in the in the draft paper that is publicly available, and the, uh, the the wording is fairly broad in the sense that the tribunal, you know, which is the term used to describe the multilateral investment court, the MIC, uh, will will have jurisdiction basically over any dispute arising out of an investment between a contracting state and a national of another contracting state, which the parties consent to submit to the tribunal. Obviously, um, you know, the, um, an investment is not defined. <laughs> uh, the parties is not defined, is not even capitalized. So it, one is left wondering whether it refers to the contracting parties or the parties to the dispute, the investor and the, the respondent state. And in fact, the commentary um, that um, um, is, uh, you know, is, is supporting those provisions um, um, you know, indicates that the drafters at this point uh, are uncertain about the, the appropriate approach to this matter and are rather thinking that, you know, it could be the, the contracting parties, it could be the disputing parties. Um, but, I mean, you know, one is left wondering what it is. Uh, I think one should look at other relevant precedents that we have that might be um, analogous. Um, Perhaps not directly analogous, but you know, we're dealing with treaties with with a huge body of bilateral treaties, as as you mentioned, Nikos. You know, the thousands of bilateral investment treaties, the investment chapters in the uh, free trade agreements, and other regional investment treaties. Um, so, you know, the the from, from public international law perspective, and what we've seen uh, previously in this sphere is that those parties that are concerned will seek to um, bring about changes to the current treaty network, the current treaty regime uh, through a subsequent treaty. Uh, and for that to be effective, it should be multilateral. Um, and we can look at um, the, the 2014 example of the Mauritius Convention. So that was the convention that extended the application of the UN controlled rules on transparency to uh, proceedings initiated out in treaties concluded before April 1st, 2014. So you have all that body of treaties. There's no provision in them uh, on transparency requirements. Um, and of course, you might have an option to um, pursue uh, unitral proceedings, exit proceedings, other, other types of proceedings. Uh, and around, the, around 2013, unitral promulgated those transparency rules that provide for enhanced transparency, public hearings, the publication of the party's pleadings, expert reports, witness statements, um, the, the uh, opportunity for third parties, the, the Miki Korea to submit, uh, to make submissions, the, the opportunity of non-disputing parties to make submission of that. But of course, the, the old body of treaties didn't contain any of those provisions. Some recent treaties around 2014 and later on do have such provisions, but not the old ones. So what the parties, you know, what some states did was they concluded the Mauritius Convention that simply provides that, as said, any treaty concluded before April 1st, 2014, um, and in proceedings uh, initiated under those treaties, um, regardless of whether they're under the UNCTAD rules or any other set of rules, like you know the exit arbitration rules, for example, the Mauritius Convention will apply. So that's one example we can look at. So. Um, you know, in our case, the, that could look like a multilateral um, treaty on setting up the multilateral investment court, uh, which would provide that um, for proceedings initiated under any treaties concluded prior to, you know, the, the date of the conclusion of the, the, the multilateral investment court treaty. Um, the provisions of the treaty will apply uh, instead of whatever dispute settlement mm -hmm. provisions, investor state dispute mechanism is provided for in that treaty. Um, or it can provide for, um, uh, you know, uh, parallelism in the sense that you could have the new system applying in parallel. But it doesn't sound like this is what the, the, the current proponents of that draft are thinking, or at least what the European Commission is thinking, judging at least from 
the uh, EU Canada CEDA, Singapore, and Vietnam free trade agreements. Um, so the the and of course when you look at those treaties, there's there's a you know there's that idea that that everything is going to be concentrated on the new mechanism that will be established. So that's one example. Um, I don't know whether this is what we'll, we will might see in the you know in a, in a further iteration of the draft paper draft convention, and of course it's something similar to what we have seen uh, in 2020 um, when uh, when the European states decided to terminate um, you know the various intra EU BITs. So uh, there was you know pre prior to that there were all those debates about the the sunset clauses in those treaties and whether the parties could affect them. And, 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 you know, the same parties came together and they decided to not only terminate the treaties themselves, but also the effect of the sunset clause of the grandfather clause providing for the, uh, um, you know, uh, further application of the treaty for 10, 15 or 20 years after its termination. Um, and that was also done through a treaty, a subsequent treaty um, uh, applying and affecting, uh, you, know, the, you know, the previous treaties. And interestingly, we see there's an annex to the um, you know, treaty that the EU member states signed to terminate the intra-EU bids that lists the various BITs that, that are terminated. So it needs some logistical support to track everything down. But, uh, you know, one would think you would have um, that global treaty providing for its application to proceedings initiated uh, in the future under treaties concluded before to uh, its, uh, you know, the, the entry into force of that global treaty. Uh, and then um, if they were thinking about terminating uh, and replacing the old system, one would have thought that there's, there's going to be a secretary or some some other body uh, helping with with the with, you know preparing all these lists of treaties that are other um, affected uh, you know or amended by the effect of that treaty. Because if you have one, let's say you, you take two parties, you have an investor that is now investing in, in country B, uh, and uh, country B has ratified the new treaty. Uh, what if the um, home state of that investor who's coming from country A hasn't ratified the new treaty? Is it applicable or not? And that, but also, um, you know, it raises questions whether also the future treaty on the multilateral investment court would allow for reservations. So mm -hmm. um, looking back at the Mauritius Convention, there's reservations whereby a state can say, I don't want the unilateral rules on transparency to apply when I'm a respondent state, mm -hmm. or I don't want them to apply uh, to um, uh, you know to my home in investors uh, when they're invoking in treaties, right? In, in those proceedings, so it depends on that. Again, the the uh, feeling that one gets by looking at unilateral's working paper is that um, a treaty like that wouldn't allow for reservations. Um, but, but, you know, again, we have to see how that might look. So um, to recap, I think one would have thought that uh, for that treaty to have um, any, any meaningful impact, mm -hmm. that, that there would have been, you know, that, that there might be a mechanism of concentration providing for the application of the new system as opposed to the old one. Um, whether it would also, in addition to that, allow uh, prospective investors and, and respondent states to uh, submit a specific dispute to that court might be left open. Um, again, it might be better if you have that in the treaty so that it's clearer. Um, absent that, uh, I, I, you know, one would have thought that the option is still available to, to putative parties to submit a dispute. But right now, um, the only guidance that we have from um, Utrecht, at least, is that they want to draft a convention that is going to be open-ended and that will cover any dispute that the parties again hopefully disputing parties or contracting parties that, that you know hopefully that will get clarified and you know submit to the jurisdiction of that court so essentially what what you're saying is that uh, with standard uh, treaty law uh, you should be able to sort out uh, these kind of things um, but just to, to uh, before we move on to the next uh, point, um, there is also a, a heightened debate now um, about um, including, or maybe even as a replacement for ISDS, state-to-state -state disputes. 
right? Um, that seems to be becoming more on vogue also in the negotiation room. There are a lot of people who are saying, you know, um, actually, you know, we don't want ISDS anymore at all. Uh, so would you think that's a great idea? And do you think uh, that would need some specific kind of like procedural jurisdictional points to cater for that? And maybe in combination to that, um, there's also the point that shouldn't also SMEs um, use the system um, because, um, you know, uh, uh, it's very expensive and uh, apparently the make would be very cheap, cheaper than arbitration. So um, what's your take? Maybe you can take those two together. Yes. Um, I'll try to be brief, because thanks. So, I mean, with respect to state or state arbitration, that's not what we see right now. That's not, it's not what's on the table. So we wouldn't have been having this discussion right now on the on the draft paper by the, the Union Control Secretariat, um, you know, had it, you know, uh, had it been the, the state or state mechanism that it was envisaged. It's not what we see. And in fact, it's not what we see in the recent treaties that the EU has signed, uh, the EU, Canada, CETA, uh, and Japan, sorry, and uh, Vietnam and Singapore free trade agreements in particular. What we see, of course, is um, state of state arbitration in addition to investor state arbitration, but uh, before a standing tribunal, um, uh, you know, a, a, an appellate body. Uh, so that's what we see. Um, so it looks like the, the the drafters of the of, of what might become the the draft multilateral investment court convention. Um, are not ruling out uh, an, an investor state dispute settlement mechanism right now. So I think um, this is here to stay, but it will um, take a different form, uh, or at least uh, some states would like it to take a different form. Uh, in terms of um, SMEs, so um, uh, and whether uh, proceedings before the multilateral investment court would be cheaper, uh, again, uh, we can prognosticate uh, the future and, and, and know for, for certain uh, what provisions will apply, um, uh, you know, to proceedings before the, the multilateral investment court and whether it would be cheaper for smaller claims. Uh, but what we see, again, I think that the closer analog is, of course, again, we're, we're always returning back to what's what has been ratified already, and, uh, which is the, the EU investment courts, let's call them that. And there's provision for a standing office because they, they realize that there's a lot of logistical issues that a standing court tribunal needs to deal with. So there needs to be, um, you know, some funds allocated to the president, right. the vice president of the, of the tribunal. But then when you look at the costs of the proceedings, um, there's, there's reference to the fact that it, it should be the parties that will bear those costs. Mm -hmm. You have a, a, a you know a, a general retainer which can become a, a proper salary for the president and the supporting function, uh, but then the parties will bear the cost. So then one is left wondering what changes. Yeah, maybe the you know the funds that are available to the president of the court, um, you know, can can uh, affect the, the total cost of the proceedings. Uh, but um, I'm not sure whether um, they, that will have a dramatic impact to the uh, you know overall costs of the no. parties will have to bear. We do see a cost allocation provisions, however, uh, which make it uh, more clear that um, uh, at least uh, you know in those treaties we see um, uh, that the parties are leaning towards uh, a cost follow the event approach. So the winner takes it all and can recover its costs. Um, I assume that's that's a good thing for uh, any claimant uh, that that feels strongly about his claim, um, but I, I don't see how it should be any different when it comes to SMEs. Um, you know, the same principles should apply. Um, yes. I don't know if I covered your points, Nickers, but uh, yeah, no, I think I mean, of course, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe I wasn't so clear, but uh, uh, what you heard, I, I don't remember if it's in the in the in the paper itself but what you heard is that you know you have this proposal about um having more um 
kind of like sole arbitrators, having uh, um, fast track procedures, you know, for small claims, you know, um, that these are things that, that you hear in the room. Uh, of course, the point is, uh, as you rightly say, speak about costs is, of course, the main costs remain the legal representations and not the arbitration costs themselves. And that, of course, um, might not change significantly because uh, as we see now in our discussion, whatever the system will be, it's going to be technical, it's going to be complex, and it will require high quality legal advice that's not coming for free. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, it's, and it's, I, becoming, it's becoming so multi-layered and multifaceted, uh, and it's very difficult to navigate through the maze of all those treaties, overlapping treaties. Um, but, but this seems to me that uh, at least looking at the EU, they're trying to uh, establish one system. And you can see that in, in, you know, for example, when the EU Canada CETA was concluded, all of the uh, BITs that Canada had concluded with EU member states were terminated. Uh, that's not what we see in other places uh, no. uh, of the world, by the way. It's not, for example, what we see uh, in China's treaty policy. Yes. So when, when China signed the ASEAN Agreement on Investment, uh, I believe in 2009, it did not terminate the, the BITs that it had with each and every one of the yes. ASEAN states. Plus, yes. and after that, uh, free trade agreements with investment chapters that it also had with some uh, ASEAN states, and some treaties that Hong Kong, its special administrative region, also had with some ASEAN states, and they all seem to apply in part, or at least one needs to apply treaty interpretation rules to, um, you know, arrive at a conclusion on, on that topic. Well, we need another webinar on that, and I know that you've been in that region, um, so uh, uh, that's going to be very complicated. But it's true. I mean, even the investment agreement EU-China as it's called, investment agreement, uh, which was signed, uh, at least it was on political agreement uh, at the end of last year, um, doesn't replace the existing uh, member state bids with China, at least for the moment. Um, at, at this moment, uh, I also again ask our attendees uh, if they have any questions or comments uh, to, to bring into the table, uh, please do so in the comment section. Um, but let's uh, move to Tuffy again, um, because I mentioned uh, in my introduction uh, like one really big, big elephant in the room, and, and that is the question about the substantive protection standards. Because what happened was um, when the uh, working group was created, um, the political compromise, um, because at that time, I should add, it was really a, a, a split room between, on the one hand, US, uh, Japan, and a couple of other Asian states um, that wanted a very limited um, mandate for the working group. And you had the EU, Canada, Mauritius, and other countries who wanted a, a broad mandate that included also substantive provisions, protection provisions, substantive protection that should be also looked at. And uh, of course, everybody uh, remembers uh, the old OECD attempt in the 1990s uh, that failed, the Mai. Um, and uh, so the idea was, okay, let's don't go down the same route again. So we are not going to do this. That was the compromise, right? But uh, every time when I'm in the negotiations, uh, following them as observer, you see that uh, a significant number of member states parties to the UNCITRA group, they raise that issue. Actually, um, I have the feeling um, what we just talked about, uh, about the nitty gritty about costs or whether it's one layer or two layered uh, uh, court system or whether it's permanent or not really permanent, that is not really on the mind of the negotiators. I think uh, what they really are talking about is we want to limit FET. We want to limit expropriation standards. We want to get rid of the umbrella clause. You know, we want to restrict the definition of investor, investment. Um, but we cannot talk about this in this working group. So the question to you is, is this working group not doing some kind of um, window dressing that actually doesn't really address the real issues? 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Nikos. It's a it's a really important question because um, that is that is the concern that many states have, and um, some of you may have seen Professor Jose Alvarez of NYU speaking at the American Society of International Law Conference in a, in a at an event where many of the leaders of the institutions, the multilateral institutions like UNCITRAL were there, but he challenged everyone and said, you're all wasting your time and this is a lost opportunity, a multilateral investment court that's tasked with interpreting different treaties in different cases isn't going to harmonize the jurisprudence without running afoul of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And he says the result is going to be an even more complex international investment regime with diverse substantive standards and diverse procedures for adjudication. Um, and so we're wasting our time and we should have gone ahead and tried to use the political cal capital that exists right now to create a multilateral convention. Um, but um, Secretary General Anna Juban Brett responded that she felt that the, the appellate mechanism will go a long way in creating consistency and correcting some of the most egregious errors of, of the investment arbitration system that exists now, because um, there is the second level appellate mechanism. It still has to be determined whether questions of law or questions of facts can be revisited, um, but there will be an appellate mechanism um, in a much stronger way, um, who will be reviewing decisions in a much stronger way than we've had in the past. And the hope is that this, the existence of this body will lead to sub some um, substantive um, unification as compared to now where you don't have hierarchy and you have these one-time tribunals. Um, but I, I think it, it remains to be seen whether or not ad hoc tribunals will take the, the decisions of this multilateral investment court um, seriously, because we have seen often um, arbitral tribunals ignoring the International Court of Justice mm -hmm. and their take on, on legitimate expectations, for example. Um, so it, it really isn't clear that all of them will, will accept what the investment court pronounces. And I think there again, um, we go back to the issue of who is who is deciding. If the more you have a, a, a court that's, that is, um, has legitimacy, that's representative, that's seen as, as being uh, made of, of brilliant minds and fair minds, I think it will be more persuasive to, to ad hoc tribunals. But in the meantime, the, you know, the states will have to continue to negotiate their own bilateral investment treaties and regional treaties addressing these substantive issues um, and the substantive standards. And you are seeing a lot of that happening. Yes. Um, but of course, uh, the question then is, I mean, uh, moving uh, kind of like uh, from a from a strategic perspective, um, moving forward, um, of course, the issue is, shouldn't there be um, a new working group, right? Um, which would waste a couple of years um, trying to find a worldwide standard uh, on FET, which then this multilateral court would presumably consistently interpret, right? Um, and the same for indirect expropriation or, you know, legitimate expectations, what have you. Um, is this a good idea to say, okay, we need a, a new working group? Um, and uh, moving forward the same way as we did with this working group, or shouldn't we um, work, uh, if you like, from the back end, which we see uh, increasingly also in CETA, but we know it actually from NAFTA, is to work with interpretations, with joint binding interpretation. So rather on an ad hoc basis that uh, states, whether or not they are respondent, but states to who are contracting parties to a uh, treaty that they consistently, systematically come in um, with their joint uh, binding interpretations. Is that, if you like, a short um, cut of creating a common core uh, basis of, of substantive standards? I think so. I think, you know, as you mentioned, there was a there was a vote in the beginning and there were not enough votes for people 
from people and, and states who wanted to proceed with a multilateral convention. So we have, this is what we have right now. And I think it will make, it can, it has the potential to, to, to improve the situation significantly if it's, if it's done right. And, and, um, and we proceed that way and, and continue to use interpretive um, guidelines and, and to, 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 to um, have states um, express what they believe the treaties mean, but you know it's 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 difficult because arbitral, as as we know, arbitral tribunals do not always take those um, guidelines into to heart, or or and there's so many interpretations of of what they mean, and and so it, but but I think there's no turning back at this point, and there's been the decision to proceed with it. Um, and deal with these issues um, first, which are which will which are very important issues to to address. Right, thank you. Um, I see that we have uh, two questions, but I would like because they are more of a general nature. I would like to keep them uh, um, for the end, so we are going to uh, to touch on them. Um, but uh, I would like now finally to move to Jeff uh, because he's been uh, listening all the time and not saying much. Um, and uh, we want to move um, to the real issue uh, because uh, Jeff is all about monetizing awards. Um, and that is, uh, uh, of course, that at the end of the day matters. How, how do you get your money actually um, when you have an award? Um, that is already um, very complicated under the current system. Um, and so the the question uh, to you um, is uh, have you spotted anything in the uh, paper of the secretariat that would make you happy with regard to this new make and make awards uh, that you say yes uh, i can work with this i can make sure that i can monetize uh, the awards be more effectively and maybe cheaper than currently the case uh, well, thanks, Nikos, <clears throat> and, and thanks everyone for having me. And uh, yeah, as you alluded to at the beginning, I I focus my practice and our firm uh, mostly on the uh, either you know monetization of awards or resisting enforcement of awards. We're not really an arbitration focused firm, but work often with arbitration lawyers to help clients with these uh, objectives. And so, <clears throat> you know, I've been looking at this really from that perspective, and also at the working paper um that has a separate working paper on appellate mechanisms and enforcement uh that has also been published and it, it raises a number of interesting questions at to to answer your specific question i see a few points that i would say from an investor from an enforcement point of view from an investor point of view are potentially encouraging the the thing that um jumped out at me most in that regard is that there is some discussion of adopting an as, um, well, either trying to fit the enforcement of these uh, awards under this new tribunal into the ICSID system, and you know, as as you know, ICS, the ICSID convention contains a a streamlined mechanism for enforcement. There is, of course, built into it an annulment procedure uh, where um, the, you know the losing party can apply for annulment, but you know, once you have the award. Um, there's a, essentially the convention says that awards are, ought to be directly enforceable as a judgment in a country where you bring it to. So there's discussion in the working papers of either trying to, through some amendments to the ICSID convention, trying to fit this new framework into that so that you could use the ICSID convention for enforcement or create a, a new enforcement mechanism mm -hmm. that would be part of the, of this treaty or separate treaty um, that would adopt a similar mechanism. So I think that that aspect is is perhaps from what I saw in the working paper, the most favorable, I would say, to investors. Um, the um, there's a couple of things that jumped out at me that I would say are probably a little bit more worrisome uh, for investors. And of course, you know, you've made the larger point earlier, I think that there is some concern that in these negotiations, it will be mainly the interests of states that are being represented. And while it's true that states, of course, also have interests in protecting their own investors, I think looking at some of the ideas in this working group paper, I get the sense that they 
you know, the balance is maybe tilted a little bit more in favor of state defendants. So, uh, for example, you know, uh, there's always a question of can an award be enforced while there is a set aside or an annulment mm -hmm. proceeding ongoing? And under the New York Convention, which is, you know, the, the most common enforcement mechanism for taking uh, ISDS awards, you know, and enforcing them around the world, the court where you're bringing it to has discretion whether or not to stay enforcement pending a set aside proceeding um, at, the, at the seat of arbitration. Similarly, in the exit system, um, you know, the ad hoc committee has discretion whether to stay enforcement of the award pending an annulment proceeding. And so at least, and, and of course, these, these working papers are drafts and there's still a lot to be developed. So it's too soon to say that this is a, a, a permanent view, but, but there are some sentences in the working paper that essentially say, well, if we're gonna build this appeal mechanism into this new system, then of course, enforcement should be stayed pending the appeal, right? And, and that is, so certainly true in many judicial systems, not everyone, everyone, by the way, I should say in the United States, typically a judgment is enforceable as soon as it's rendered by the first instance court, even if there's an appeal pending, unless, for example, the losing party has uh, posted security uh, to the court to ensure that the uh, that the creditor will get paid. But would that happen here? Right. Would you know, would a state be required to post security so that if the state loses on appeal, then the, the, the investor knows it's going to get paid. And I've seen no mention of that. So maybe it'll be added at some point, but I would I would venture to guess that it's unlikely. Um, so that's, a, I think, a, you know, a, a, a concern, I suppose. Um, uh, you know, the other other question um, uh, is, is on, you know, immunity waiver, uh, which is um, you know something that comes up a lot in that enforcement stage against sovereign states where um you, know, you really have two kinds of immunity that come into play one is immunity from jurisdiction where you might be trying to enforce an award and uh you know and and there's a question whether the court the enforcement court has the power to to enforce that now in many jurisdictions many countries that's not a problem including the us where i practiced it you know, the, the, the sovereign immunities law provides for an exception that says if you're enforcing an arbitration award, you know, there's an exception to immunity. But then there is also immunity as to the assets, right? And that's really where, you know, the rubber meets the road a lot when you're trying to monetize an award as an investor. It's like, okay, I have this award, but then I'm looking for assets. The other side's not paying voluntarily. Now I have to chase assets. And then the state will say, oh, well, this is, you know, protected by immunity, you cannot, you know, you cannot go after this asset. And essentially, the, you know, the carve out globally is that if it's an asset in commercial use, then or for commercial purposes, then usually you can go after it. Um, but, you know, I guess if, if, if investors had a lot of bargaining power in this discussion, I might say, well, if, if you states are creating this whole new mechanism with an appeal procedure and arbitrators that are selected by states not by us investors well then you know as a as a uh, as a quid pro quo we would want you to say well you know we want we want security that if we win as an investor that we're going to get paid right and that we're going to either you know either you post security to the court so that we get paid automatically or you waive immunity uh, as to your assets so that we can just go after assets without then having to litigate the immunity issue yeah. over and over and over again, which is the reality of what happens now. So I, look, I don't think that that's a realistic prospect. Uh, that's, a, that's a very big ask, if you will, if you're an investor, that would be great to have. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and frankly, what would maybe, uh, you know, put some of us enforcement lawyers out of business because you then don't have to litigate the, the immunity issues so much anymore. <laughs> but I, I think that is a question of, you know, if you're adding this appeal mechanism, which is gonna, you know, increase the, the time uh, before which you can actually start enforcement and potentially the cost that was discussed, um, you know, you, you, you're no longer, you know, um, in front of arbitrators that you've selected and then, you know, is there anything to compensate at the back end at the enforcement stage to make it easier for the, for you to collect? Or does it just, you know, does the whole thing just become a lot harder? So those are some initial, you know, observations. 
Um, and, uh, um, you know, there's a lot more that can be said, but I, I think those are some, some interesting questions that arise. I, I really like this kind of compensatory aspect that you raised. I think that's really interesting. Um, um, but maybe just before we, we sort of wrap up and, and, and uh, include the questions as well, uh, hopefully in, in the last round, um, there has been a big discussion, uh, at, at least in, in the beginning. I don't hear it so much anymore, but there was a big discussion whether um, these make awards uh, whether they fit the current system. Some people say definitely it doesn't fit the, the, the exit convention because the exit uh, convention excludes uh, any kind of like appeal thing, you know, it's a self-contained regime. It can never be within the exit. Then, you know, people say, oh, let's look at the New York convention. But then, you know, the New York convention talks about arbitral award, arbitration, which talks about party autonomy. We don't have party autonomy in this mixed system, at least to a large extent, not anymore. So it doesn't fit the New York Convention either, some say. Um, so um, would, you, would you say that this creates such a insecurity, legal insecurity, that you say we actually need a tailor-made new convention specifically for these make awards? Well, um... I'm not sure that 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 alone would be a reason for a new convention. I, I, you know, there's some compelling arguments for why it would fit into the New York Convention, mm -hmm. and I think you know the, the the working papers talk about you know that that this new mix system could include language you know in its founding documents stating that it is an arbitration, right? Or or using words that would fit it into the you know into the box of the New York Convention. Where it defines, you know, what a, you know, what the New York Convention applies to and its arbitration and commercial matters, you know, that that could be, in theory, be be put in this into this new MIC convention. It could be, you know, there could be all kinds of statements made by the the the, the state parties, you know, where they essentially declare that that is their intention. Um, mm -hmm. Ultimately, of course, it would be up to the enforcing states' courts. Um, whether they would agree with that. And if it's not, and if the enforcing states state is not a party to the new mixed system, you know, then you do have risk there where, you know, you wouldn't know uh, whether the court would agree that it fits in the New York Convention. Um, I, I think probably, you know, the risk could be mitigated by these types of statements and using particular language to try to fit it into the New York Convention. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say that that alone is a reason that you need a whole separate enforcement mechanism, but certainly that that's something that needs to be, um, you know, needs to be thought about uh, a bit more. But it does, of course, the whole thing, it, it, it's a little bit odd because, you know, the New York Convention was designed for, um, you know, essentially being able to take an award quickly, enforce it, you know, wherever yes. you go. And this is an entirely new framework that turns it very much more into kind of a court system which is not, of course, what was envisioned when the New York Convention was adopted. Um, there's one last qu interesting point, if I just can say it quickly. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, there's a there's a se several decisions in in both the United States and in Canada and, and maybe elsewhere that have have said that um, a state waives its immunity from suit if it. Um, has adopted the New York Convention, if it has, it's a signatory to the New York Convention, and it has then agreed to arbitrate in another New York Convention state. And certainly, you know, there have been, you know, debates about whether that is a, a you know, correct reasoning. But the idea being that if a country, you know, adopts a New York Convention, they understand what it means, and then they voluntarily agree to arbitrate in another convention state, well, they, they, they have implicitly waived immunity from enforcement in yet other New York Convention states because they understand that these awards kind of get transported around the world for enforcement purposes. Of course, if you remove kind of the seat of the arbitration and, and, and you all would have a better sense of how that might happen under the mix system, but there's perhaps no longer a country where you're really arbitrating, um, then that uh, art potentially removes that type of community waiver as well. So that's just another thing to keep in mind if you're, you know, looking at this as an investor. 
I sense there is a lot of issues here, which personally for me would actually really um, make it necessary to have a specific agreement on this. But unfortunately, uh, time is running up, but suddenly at the last minute, the question's popping up uh, in the commentary um, section. Um, so uh, uh, I start, uh, of course, again with uh, Tafi, um, uh, and I would say um, choose whatever you like uh, from the from the uh, comment side uh, or generally how you wish to to wrap up uh, maybe just to to mention those points so there, there are the, the first two questions really regarding you know whether you know uh, the whole uh, new thing addresses really the legitimacy issue isds um the other question is are we going to see uh, which is often argued what a bad effect uh, towards contract-based arbitration for those who can uh, get a contract and therefore dispute um, and well some other issues but uh, Tafi it's your choice thanks so much there, there's so much to discuss and and it's a pity we can't get into all of these I just want to briefly um, maybe touch on the first question about you know is there does the e is there any plausible explanation for the EU argument that the legitimacy of the ISDS will be enhanced by creating an investment court as opposed to arbitration? And I th I think there 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 really is a, a, a strong argument that the court could address the legitimacy concerns. And when you think about the typical arbitration case that led to these concerns, where a state is seeking to regulate on the environment or some some issue, um, and you have three private lawyers deciding um, whether or not this was an expropriation or if this was an appropriate regulation, and the people who are deciding are picked by um, picked by picked by the parties, and they um, some of them are thinking about the next appointment, and and also there's no review mechanism. There was just a concern that these issues are too important. Arbitration is a fantastic system and it has many pros in certain certain fora but maybe when we're talking about states and and these so many Im important questions are at stake you need a review mechanism you need to make sure that the people um, who are making decisions are have no conflict and it's worth having a different system and i think the system that's being proposed um, does help address those legitimacy concerns but the extent to which it does will will it will depend on what the what is negotiated ultimately in november and going forward and indeed what the input will be uh, from other stakeholders. Let's don't forget about that. Uh, Odysseus, uh, your last words. Uh, well, there's, there's so many, you know, topics that, um, you know, couldn't like to, left, to leave unaddressed, but uh, of course, there's the time constraints always. I just want to add on one point first on enforcement. Jeff, sorry for entering your domain there, but, uh, you know, I can already see the questions coming from litigation funders and, you know, and enforcers uh, on whether um, awards issued by those tribunals, um, the court, but also the EU tribunals, uh, would be enforceable. So that's the, the first question we will all receive. And, and of course, we need to look at precedents. And um, I think the closest is the Iran-US Claims Tribunal. Uh, and when that tribunal was established, uh, the, you know, the, the contracting parties, the, the United States and Iran, uh, provided for the application of the UN Central rules. Uh, and when the matter ended up before the U.S. courts, um, the, the, the debate was whether those, um, you know, decisions from the Iran U.S. Claim Tribunal were enforceable. And, and when you look at the New York Convention, there's, I think, Article 1-2 talks about standing arbitral bodies in addition to ad hoc um, you know, tribunals that the parties might establish. So I think it makes it a bit, bit easier. And that's why I think when you look at the EU treaties and also the draft multilateral investment treaty, there's the use of tribunal as a term, as opposed to a court. Yes, the court might be in the heading, but then when we talk about the specifics of the um, dispute settlement mechanisms, always talk about the tribunal, the appellate body of the tribunal, but it's always the tribunal. And it's interesting because when the matter ended before, I think it was the, the California courts and then maybe up to the uh, Ninth Circuit. Um, so the, the point was, no, it is a standing body. That there is consent through through a specific treaty, uh, as Jeff, as uh, you know, mentioned, uh, being one of the requirements. Uh, and I think the point of the other side we're trying to uh, to make was that 
yes, but it should be under national laws and a commercial dispute under national laws. So uh, international dispute should not be covered. Uh, but then the, the U.S. courts felt that it was a commercial dispute within the, the scope of the New York Convention. That's what I want to add on that. And then there's, thank, I really want to thank the audience for these, um, um, you know, exciting, I'd say, uh, they're called them uh, and provocative questions. Um, I don't, you know, this, it's difficult to pick, but let's just, you know, there's, there's that question on the contract-based arbitrations against states. Um, yes, I think we see a tendency and, and part is being more sophisticated in concession contracts or otherwise. Um, one needs to be extra careful. I think um, if, uh, what we see from the draft paper is, is a tendency to be open. So uh, it might be that there's going to be the default mechanism applying to treaties um, and proceedings on the treaties, but then the parties might want to conclude a contract that would provide, for example, for uh, uh, proceedings before the multilateral investment tribunal or court. It's interesting to note that the uh, EU treaties, when setting up the tribunal and appellate body mechanisms, provide for um uh, the administration of the proceedings with support from the exit secretary that's that's an interesting point because i think that you know the eu itself realized that it doesn't have the standing body that, that can um facilitate those proceedings so then 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 you know those proceedings under say the eu singapore uh, agreement on investment will be facilitated by the exit secretariat and there's going to be a claim registered uh, you know with exit um, but, you know, oddly enough, uh, you know, under the exit convention, uh, and then that, that raises the question, okay, well, the New York convention, perhaps there's some leeway because of the, the references to the standing arbitral body, uh, but how about the New York convention? Um, to what, to what, you know, the common point when one needs to ask, um, what is it that it, it's inherent in the meaning of an exit award and to what extent the parties can, can amend that? and alter it. Um, this is where we are, this is where we stand. And the final point I'd say on uh, looking at the questions again, contract-based arbitrations, um, interesting thought. Um, w w will they, you know, are they available in intra-EU disputes also? I appreciate there's not a mm -hmm. topic we're discussing, but also mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, can you circumvent all these treaties and, and what's happening and the judgments of the ECJ? Um, that's, that's something that needs to be um, investigated further. And uh, last point on legitimacy of the ISDS system by establishing um, a standing court. Well, um, I think by giving one minute, audience, uh, yes, one minute, please. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> because, yeah, I just 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 need thirty <laughs> seconds, and I can conclude those thoughts. Uh, so the point is, the point I wanted to say is that um, yes the contracting parties in the community at large might feel that there's going to be the system will be more legitimized because then the contracting parties have the ability to uh, select the uh, members of the panel and also specify the requirements and what we see in the eu treaties is that for the first instance tribunal the individuals need to have the qualifications that are required for, for appointment to judicial office uh, or be juries of recognized companies and all that but for the appellate body and uh, then you have the qualifications required uh, for appointment to the highest judicial office so you know that's of course not a rule and and investor state arbitration as a card that applies in those treaties and, and and um you know i'll stop there there's more questions nikas but i i, I yes. have to stop. Yeah. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, unfortunately, but maybe we can we can continue later uh, offline um, with uh, the the um, networking uh, part. But final words uh, to 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 Jeff. I mean, uh, maybe uh, generally, do you see still the system continuing, or will there be kind of really a radical change, or will it be more like a slow tanker that's really slowly moving towards this reform or is it going to be really abrupt what what's your take are you relaxed about all this and <laughs> well you know i yeah i i don't have i suppose as good a sense as you do perhaps uh in terms of how how these things are progressing i i did want to just say one more thing about 
you know, the, the, this idea of a separate enforcement mechanism. And I, I do agree with you that if you're, you know, if you're an investor, um, then there is comfort to be gained if there is a clear, clearly defined enforcement mechanism in this system. And so the reason why I said that, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily, you know, something that one would need is, first of all, you know, as I said, like they, the states could provide, you know, that they even agree that these awards should be enforceable under the New York Convention, which of course is also agreed by the state party. So I think would be given a lot of weight. And it does seem that um, commentators generally agree that the New York Convention would work. But it, that's not, it's also just because, you know, there's a big unknown, right? If you say, all right, well, we need a separate enforcement mechanism, which I agree with, you know, could give a lot of comfort. And if it, if it sort of follows the ICSID model could actually be very effective. But, you know, I don't know what else states are going to end up putting in there, right? And I think that would be very interesting to see is like, what would the proposals be, right? And would it, for example, include this idea that uh, there would be a, a, a total, you know, bar to enforcement uh, while, um, you know, while the appeal is pending? Um, and, and that, you know, in the ICSID model, as I mentioned earlier, States have uh, or investors have have been successful sometimes in 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 you know, defeating attempts to to stay enforcement pending annulment, and and I think as an investor you want to see that option uh, rather than there being just uh, you know an automatic stay because frankly um, if there's an automatic right of appeal it could be a frivolous appeal um, and yet uh, a state can then drag out you know, the proceeding for an additional several years before you even can start thinking about collection. So I do think that, uh, you know, the, it's a cliche, but devil is in the details, of course, and want to see how it's constructed and whether uh, as an investor, whether it sufficiently, you know, provides protections. Thank you. Well, it's not a cliche. I think as we uh, clearly uh, shown, uh, it's, it's uh, um, I think, uh, the make or break of the whole exercise they have to get right um, uh, in the details. I think that is really important. Um, at the same time, um, of course, uh, uh, there is, uh, how can I say, there is this political layer um, that is hanging over the negotiations. You know, they, they, uh, they have to uh, deliver um, quickly, uh, substantially. And uh, when you do that, we all know you might make mistakes or you might forget about uh, important details. And uh, with that, I see uh, John is coming in and I must apologize uh, that I wasn't uh, so strict to stay within the hour, but I think it was um, worth it. Well, I do apologize that my, my appearance signifies the, the absolute end of this. I was very much enjoying that and I'm sure everyone else did as well. So. On that note, a big thank you to, to all the speakers for, for joining. Uh, some great, great insights there. Thank you very much. And also the international viewers for, for tuning in. Um, had some great questions added. Um, uh, the Hopin platform will be open for another half an hour or so. So if you do want to uh, make use of the, the speed networking function, it's just on the left-hand side of the screen. If you want to talk to some other people that are on, the, um, on this webinar, then that's entirely possible. Um, a final piece from me is uh, to let you know that following on for this webinar, we have uh, we launched the 22 edition um, of International Comparative Legal Guide to Investor State Arbitration. Uh, the new edition is coming out soon, so at the end of the month, so stay tuned for that. Um, and once again, thank you to, to everyone. Um, and that's a, and that's a wrap. So uh, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you all. It was really great. Thank you.